say, um, I know I've been out for the last couple Sundays, and I just really appreciate your flexibility and your grace um, with that. Family's doing a lot better. Um, yeah, and we're just trying to get our energy back up and our strength back up, but thank, praise the Lord, we had mild cases. So, And my husband never got it, so that's, that's a good thing, too. So, yeah, I just want to thank you for your grace and your flexibility with that. Okay, um, to start off announcements today, there is a new Bible study opportunity I wanted to share with you. I posted a little bit about it on Facebook, but I wanted to talk about it. So this is a little bit different. Um, some of the ladies over at Cisna came up with this idea. There is a show called The Chosen, and this show is based on the three years of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And it goes into depth about what he did, how he called all his disciples, and it's a really, really excellent show. So what we're going to be doing is for about eight weeks, we're going to be getting together for this study at the Cisna Park Church. Everybody is welcome. You don't have to attend Cisna in order to join. It's open to anybody. What we're going to do is we're going to gather in the sanctuary, watch one episode per week for eight weeks. Um, for the first season and then what we're going to do if anyone wants to stay after to dig in and do Bible study based on the show We will be doing that afterwards. So it's gonna run. It's gonna start Wednesday 6 30 till about 8 o'clock and we're gonna watch the show first and then whoever wants to stay for study after Can stay after and we'll dig into the Bible. We'll discuss um, And it'll be a good time. So Everybody is welcome, male, female, near and far, wherever you're from. It's just all about getting to know Jesus a little bit better and just doing this in kind of a different and unique way. If you have any questions about it, please let me know. Now, um, we had to forego the um, September birthday breakfast because of all things COVID, and that's wonderful. Is anyone here have a September birthday? Nolan, can you stand up? Nolan turned six a couple of days ago. Can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Nolan, are you excited to be six? Yeah? Did you have a fun birthday? Well, happy birthday, buddy, and we're so glad you're here today. You're welcome. Did anyone else in here have a September birthday? No? Okay, well, if you're watching at home, if you have a September birthday, happy birthday to you. Um, and Nolan, we're so excited you're here today, and we're just so happy. You are six years old. You're turning into a little man, aren't you? <laughs> um, a couple other announcements. This was supposed to be announced the past couple Sundays. I apologize. Bill Polson's birthday was on September 9th, but if you would still like to send him um, and shower him with some cards, his address is there. Um, so feel free if you would like to do that. And if you need that address again later, just let me know. Um, a couple of meetings coming up this month. There will be a trustees meeting next Sunday following service. Um, we'll just meet in here or in the fellowship hall. There will be a finance meeting September 20th, which is actually a Monday. This is a little bit different. Now that I'm in seminary, I have Tuesday evening classes that I have to do that. So this will be on Monday night at 6 p.m. And then there's an ad board meeting on Wednesday of that week. That one is slightly earlier than normal, starting at 5.15. Okay, so those are the meetings coming up. Does anyone have any other announcements? That they would like to share at this time? Will the ad board be here or will it be Zoom? Um, we'll have it here. If you would like to Zoom in, we can Zoom you in on someone's phone. And the trust hold. Any other announcements? Anything I missed? No. Okay. Well, I invite you to join me in our call to worship today. We can trust God. God is like the mountains, rock solid. God loves all people. 
the poor, the disabled, the outcast, the stranger. We can depend on God. God feeds the hungry, heals the sick, and restores relationships. Praise our loving God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. At this time, I'd like to invite you to join me in our opening hymn, Trust and Obey. It is number 467 in your hymnal, and it is up on the screen. And I invite you to please stand as you are able. Generous God, we give thanks to you for your kindness towards us. Thank you for loving us all and calling us all your children. Help us to recognize our kin and to give our lives to peaceful family relationships with all creation. Free us from our self-centeredness and from fear of strangers so that we may meet the Savior in broken humanity. Even our own. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. From this time on and forevermore, for the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous might not stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their own crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evil doers. Peace be upon Israel. This is the word of the Lord. At this time, I'd like to move into um, joys and concerns <coughs> that we would like to bring to God today. So I'd like to ask, would anyone like to share a concern or a joy that they have today? Ruby? I have a joy and a concern. Okay. Um, I have a new great-grandson, and he was born with many health issues. Okay. 
So he's already had one surgery and he's facing many, many more. Okay. Uh, this is Melissa, Diana's daughter, okay. that is a Kentucky. It's her son. And what's his name? Peter, and I don't know what his middle name is. I okay. keep getting asked. Okay. So little Peter. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I would like to lift up um, one of my good friends, families that we that I grew up with. Um, her father, their father, I know all of them, um, passed away last week. Very suddenly, they discovered um, he had bladder cancer about a month ago, and it was very, very far advanced. So he passed away. Um, so I just asked if we could keep the Oboyle family in our prayers today. Anyone else? Okay, I would also like to lift up, um, we all know yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the attack in New York. Um, I have a special prayer for um, to remember later, but I do want to lift up those who lost their lives, um, those who rushed in so selflessly to serve, um, and those who are still serving today, and those um, who are still dealing with that loss today. So if there are no other joys or no concerns, um, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for being able to come together to worship today. Thank you, Lord, for being sovereign, for being completely in control. When our world feels like it's falling in part, we just look to you, Lord, because we know that nothing surprises you and that you are in complete control. Lord, we thank you. I thank you for all of these people here today who have come to worship you. And we want to lift their requests, their joys to you. For little Peter, who is here on earth with us now, Lord, what a blessing he is. But he has got some challenges ahead, and you know what he is facing. So, Lord, we lift him to you to help him meet and um, beat those challenges that he has. Please be with him, with his family with his medical team that is taking care of him. Lord, we thank you for being in control. For the Oboyle family who has recently lost their father, Dan, Lord, he was a wonderful, wonderful man who loved his family dearly. I ask that you be with that family today, with his children, with his grandchildren, and bring them peace and comfort. Lord, for any other unspoken joys, unspoken challenges that people are facing, we know that you know what they need, and we take comfort in that. And thank you so much for meeting their needs. And Lord, we remember, we remember what happened 20 years ago yesterday. Please be with those people who are still grieving the losses that are still so fresh in their hearts. We thank the people who so who served and rushed in to help and to serve so selflessly. Thank you, Lord, for those helpers. And now at this time, with the confidence of the children of God, please join me as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we'll move into our time of offering. We are still keeping the collection plate at the back, but I invite you during this time, if you have any prayers that you want to offer up to the Lord individually, this is a wonderful time to pray and reflect.
You have provided all that we need for full lives, and yet we don't stop there. We continue to fill our lives with things in an elusive search for security. As we bring gifts to you this day, remind us that only deeper faith will bring peace and good works. Caring for others through generous giving will help us know the joy of full lives. We pray this in the name of Christ, who gave all out of love for your children. Amen. You may be seated. Our next scripture today comes from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, well, to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray before we begin hearing God's message today. Merciful God, you are all-powerful and glorious. Thank you for the opportunity and freedom to worship you. Please help open our minds and hearts to receive your word. And please bless the reading, preaching, and teaching of your word today. Amen. So, good morning again, and thank you for being in worship today. It's another beautiful day. I'm glad to see your faces, even though we are wearing the masks again. Um, and again, just thank you for your flexibility these last couple of weeks. I really appreciate it. We are continuing on in the book of James. And I, this is completely the English teacher side of me. I just love his style of writing. I'm a nerd. I, I own that. Um, but I just love it. And when I got comfortable enough to open my Bible and read it on my own without the guide of a study or any sort of assistance with it. James was the first book that I opened. Now, in full disclosure, I chose it because it was one of the books that was relatively short, but not too short, so I still kind of felt accomplished by the time I got to the end of it. Um, and I was just proud that I finally read a book of the Bible on my own, in my own time. Something I appreciate about James is that his book and his style of writing is blunt and straight and to the point. He does not mince words when it comes to Christian living and how we should live out God's word. And sometimes there are things that he brings up that are hard to hear. This week is no exception as he cautions us on making distinctions. James is not shy about saying some hard things and about calling people out on their biases. This particular chapter in um, the scripture I read, and that's in your 
pamphlet in your bulletin is titled Warning Against Partiality. In the New International Version of the Bible, it's titled Favoritism Forbidden. In the Christian Standard Bible, it's titled The Sin of Favoritism. At this point, you get the idea. Showing favoritism, playing favorites, showing partiality is not looked kindly on in the Bible. It's actually condemned in the Old Testament, and it's contrary to God's character. Yet, we live in a society in which appearances are valued in positive and in negative ways. We have been conditioned to value outward appearances instead of valuing the being of a person. We make judgments on what people look like or how they act rather than who they are. Lines are drawn and distinctions are set, and then that can get us into all sorts of trouble. Verses 2 through 4 from the main scripture today in James state, For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, Have a seat here, please. While to the one who is poor you say, Stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James is pointing out distinctions in economic terms in this example. But that isn't the only distinction that they dealt with back then. Another was whether or not a person was Jew or a Gentile. And if you remember at the beginning of our study of Ephesians earlier in the summer, the author of Ephesians said that there is no difference when we are one in Christ. There are so many ways these distinctions are shown in our world. And we have to remember that it's the world that draws these distinctions, not God. Economics is still a major distinction we deal with. Race and ethnicity, Christian and non-Christian, gay and straight, male and female, or even more recently, masked and unmasked, vaccinated and unvaccinated, young and old, even town versus town. When I was a kid and I was in junior high, I was from the wrong town that fed into my high school. And let me tell you, some of those kids made that known. <laughs> what it comes down to is those like me versus those not like me. And we do this unconsciously. We give preferential treatment to those of our own race, our own gender, political choices, whether we need to or not. It just, it happens. Just a silly example. Since getting into ministry, I've heard quite a few jokes about Methodists versus Lutherans. Okay, and some people at Cisna were chuckling a little bit, because we've all kind of heard those jokes, and they're meant in good fun and in jest. But there's still a distinction that's made there, right? Um, sometimes these lines are drawn consciously and obviously, and sometimes they're unconscious, and we don't know what's happening. But either way, we need to make a conscious effort to combat this, especially when it comes to welcoming all people of God. We need to educate ourselves, because even though there are people who are not like me or who live differently than I do, they are just as worthy of God's grace and must be invited to his table. And remember, we are all made under, we are all made one under Christ, and we are all children of God. Just to give you another example, there was one time I was fresh out of college and about to start my teaching career. I was talking with someone who was also a teacher. This person was probably about a year or two ahead of me. And somehow, as nerdy and silly as this sounds, we were on the subject talking about standardized testing. Because you know people do that for fun, right? Really exciting, I know. Joan asked me how we got onto the topic of standardized testing because I, I don't remember how we got there. But this is what I do remember from that conversation. This conversation, we started talking about how, you know, you have to fill in the bubbles for your name, your information. You go through color in the bubbles. And then one of the categories, of course, is you have to fill in your race and ethnicity. At this point, this person looked at me and said, well, what do you fill in? They don't have a category for you yet. So, 
that was a major distinction drawn with this person. So why, why do we have to have categories? Over the years, I've had people ask me, are you Hispanic? Are you Greek? One time I got a Persian, which I thought was kind of funny because I was like, I don't even know what Persia is. <laughs> so, um, but we do this. We ask questions to learn and to make connections. And especially when we don't know someone or we don't understand something, and we should. We should make an honest effort and pure effort to get to know our neighbor, to get to know our brothers and sisters. And I think the majority of the time it is innocent because it's good to learn about others and where they come from. But it's easy to make judgments that divide if we're not attuned to what's happening. And if we're not attuned to the unique experiences that each child of God has in their background and brings to the table. So I'd like to draw our attention back to the first verse from James today. He asks, my brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? This is where James hits us hard. Do our acts and our words show that we believe that Christ is the Lord of our lives? I mentioned in the message last week, um, if you saw it online, that the good acts or works that we do are born out of our salvation by faith. It's not faith versus works, where they kind of combat with each other. It's faith and works that come together and work together. James points this out. He says, can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, but you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. If we do not put our feet to faith and make a move to live this out, then what are we doing? As James said, faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So let's think about how we are living out our salvation that Jesus has for each one of us. Do our actions and the way we live reflects the faith we have in Jesus. Do we believe that Christ is who he says he is? Are we actually living out this belief and putting our feet to faith and living as he said for us to live? How are we living this out as a church family? Are we reflecting that Jesus is our Lord and we are living and serving in love? Now, I just rattled off a bunch of hard questions, and they're not one we can really so easily answer with a word or two if we really take time to think about it. And truth be told, it is so hard in this world right now to not make distinctions and not make judgments. We as a world are so divided right now in so many ways. I mentioned some of them earlier in the sermon, and there are so many more that I haven't mentioned. And these things can really have us question where we stand in our thoughts, opinions, beliefs on certain issues because we deal with uncertainty and doubt and biases and disbelief. But the thing is, if we don't make the effort to try and learn and understand, then we're going to keep dividing. So when we think about what may divide us, when we think about everything that is happening in us and around us, we need to reflect on our faith that we have in God. Here are some questions we should ask ourselves, just to think about. Do I believe God is who he says he is? Do I have faith in him? How am I in my relationship with God? Now let's back up a second and think about that word, believe, that I mentioned and that James mentioned in the first verse. According to umcdiscipleship.org, the word believe means intellectual assent. So to believe something is to hold it in our heads, hold it in our brains. Sometimes we use the word fact, sometimes we use the word truth. The same site also says that we should believe in the New Testament sense. And what they mean by that is, they say, 
When John 3.16 declares that whosoever believes, it isn't only asking for an intellectual assent to the idea of Christ. It's not asking us to hold Christ in our heads. It is asking for a life that reflects that core belief. It isn't really asking, do you believe, but are you willing to put your life on it? Does your life and your witness to your actions and your words tell us that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life? This is where James is trying to get to us. At the core of believing, how we view and treat others and the way we live our lives is a reflection of that belief and that faith. We're not called to play favorites with anyone who seeks God. All persons who seek after God should not be hindered from coming to his feet and receiving that endless grace and mercy that he has for everybody. God does not play favorites. So as we move forward, let's think about how can we reflect Jesus as Lord of our life. As a church, let's think about how we greet one another, which I know is hard living in this pandemic world right now, I feel really stunted because I am a hugger, and I want to hug everybody, and I can't, and it's driving me crazy. <laughs> but how do we greet maybe a new person who's never been to church before? Do we greet them in the same way that we greet someone who's been coming to the same church for 40 years? Are our actions in public and private consistent to reflect God's love? Now, I'm asking these questions not to make anyone feel guilty or feel shame. I have told people on multiple occasions that whatever I get up here and preach on is what I need to hear as well. But in a world that is so divided right now, in a world that has so many distinctive lines drawn, let's think about and make an effort to reflect on what it means to try and combat those lines, to live and love like Jesus did. Because we, as a church, as a society, as people, could radically change the world if these lines were taken away. Again, I love how James has a way with words and getting straight to the point. The discipleship site I mentioned earlier captures that central idea perfectly. They say, James is saying that true faith has to come out in words and in deeds. It isn't just about what resides in our heads but what comes through our hands. Let's pray together today. Gracious and loving Lord, please help us to erase those lines that divide. Help us to see everyone as a child of God as you see us. Thank you for not making distinctions among all of us. You love us all and care for us, and it is our job to do the same, to bring your kingdom here on earth. It's in your glorious name I pray. Amen. So I am so excited to be able to invite all of you to partake in communion today. An act of God's love and grace and mercy in which there are no distinctions amongst one another. And an opportunity to all come together and share a meal in this sacrament. In the United Methodist Church, we observe an open table which means you do not have to be a church member or a Methodist to come to the Lord's table and take part in this meal. At this time, I invite you to stand as we sing the refrain to one bread, one body, and then prepare to take part in communion together. Please stand as you are able. invites to his table all who love him, 
who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. And at this time, I invite you to join me in this prayer of confession and pardon. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is a right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, and in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. At this time, I invite you to come and partake in communion. This is a little bit different since COVID. So we have the cups again. However, they are slightly different. So now, they're kind of cute. They're shaped like chalices, which I thought was kind of fun. But now, with um, the wrapping to take off, the bread is in the bottom. Okay, so we will take communion together when we are in our seats and we will start with the bread in the bottom. But at this time, the table is ready and I invite you to come forward and please take your 
So to begin, we'll start with the bottom part that has the cracker in it. Peel that off. This is the body of Christ given for you. And then we will move to the juice. This is the blood of Christ given for you. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we will sing our closing hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It is number 526 in your hymnal, and it is up on the screen as well. So this time, please stand as you are able. September 11. We remember. God of history and remembrance, we remember. We remember when the towers fell and the lives were lost. We remember the dust and the smoke, the despair and the grief. We remember that sense of vulnerability and shock. We remember the numbness that overwhelmed us as we watched our screens for hours and hours, waiting for an explanation and understanding that never came. We remember. We remember. God of hope and presence, we remember. We remember the heroes, those who rushed to help, who guided the wounded down innumerable flights of stairs who rose to overwhelm those who held death in their hands. <coughs> we remember the hours and the days of binding wounds and healing hurts, giving comfort, drying tears, 
we remember words of support and compassion from nations far and wide. We remember. We remember in part because we see the ripples of that tragic day continue to impact our world 20 years later. We grieve with allies today as our allies grieved with us 20 years ago. And together we wonder if there will ever be an end to violence, to war, to hatred, to death. We remember and we grieve our world's inability to learn the things that lead to peace. We call to you now in our remembrance, God of justice and of peace. Give us a will to truly pray that your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven. On this day of solemn remembrance, may we honor the lives that were lost in this tragic act. May we give thanks for those who served and saved, rendered aid and assistance. May we give comfort to those who live with loss. May we seek justice and peace where it is within our ability and rely on you when the ability escapes us. On this day of solemn remembrance, may we build what has been torn down. May we mend what has been broken. May we live your love when hate seems to reign. May we bear witness to the cause of peace. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So I want to thank you all for coming to church today. It's wonderful to see you. I pray you all have a blessed and wonderful week, and I want to leave you with this blessing as you go. As you have been fed, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have been received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing which you have received from the Creator, Christ and Holy Spirit be always with you. Amen. Go in peace. <clears throat>